Hello and welcome to all of you who are joining us for this uh, first of many uh, 20th anniversary lecture series of the Mountain Research Initiative. Uh, we'll, we'll give the, the colleagues a couple more minutes to join in. Uh, we see a steady stream of people joining this lecture, so we'll give people a couple more minutes at least to, to, to join us and we'll get started. In the meantime, uh, can I remind you that uh, as part of this lecture series, we are hoping to also share these recordings um, with others. Uh, therefore, we are having this uh, session uh, recorded just for your information. And also to mention in the chat, uh, we have placed a link uh, where you can download the slides that our speaker, Niels uh, Hadaway, has uh, very kindly shared uh, with us for you to to refer to as part of the presentation. So in the meantime, you have the opportunity to download uh, those slides and we'll get started in a, in a minute or so. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, we will share the link again in the chat for those of you who are just joining us now. Welcome, uh, thanks for joining us. And um, just to begin the presentation today, my name is Carolina Adler. I'm the Executive Director of the Mountain uh, Research Initiative, a research coordination network dedicated to the study of, of mountains, its people and ecosystems. And we are very glad to be celebrating this year our 20th anniversary um, since the founding of the Coordination Office uh, in 2001. And uh, this uh, year being, of course, also affected by many, uh, like many of us um, with, around the COVID-19 situation, we've had to turn a lot of our activities uh, virtual, online. And uh, one of the things that we would like to share with you is, of course, this anniversary lecture series, uh, which uh, I've been made available virtually to anyone around the world. So at this point, um, I will be very happy to then introduce our um, first speaker as part of this lecture series. Uh, his name is Neil Hadaway. He is a senior research fellow at the Stockholm Environment Institute and a Humboldt Experience Research Fellow at the Mercator Research Institute in Berlin. He works on various projects involving evidence synthesis on environmental and development topics, and his research in particular is focused on the provision of reliable evidence for policy and practice decision making and increasing the transparency in environmental management. And one of the things uh, that we felt uh, was very important for us to highlight as part of today's presentation is that uh, the MRI is also supporting many funding opportunities for, for, for seed projects, such as uh, synthesis workshops. And uh, a new call will be made available very soon towards the end of March. And we felt that uh, Neil's presentation, and in particular the paper that he will present today, provides a very good opportunity as a primer to um, be reminded of some of the caveats and um, considerations that are needed when conducting not only uh, review um, papers, but also the synthesis of evidence in general. And we felt that this was particularly timely as an opportunity to share this, um, uh, these insights with you here today. So we're very glad to have uh, many of you joining here today. On that note, a reminder, this is uh, being uh, recorded and you're welcome to, of course, direct your questions by the Q&A um, function that you see along the bottom of your screen. So feel free to please uh, take note of your questions and we will come back to that towards the end of the uh, presentation in this hour. So with that, I would like to once again welcome all of you and welcome especially Neil. Thank you for joining us, Neil. And, um, 
I would be happy to hand the floor over to you. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Carolina. Um, it's great to be here today. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm really honored to be the first in this uh, series for what is a really important um, research institute and um, initiative and a really important set of, of lectures, I think. Um, I'm going to talk to you today um, about uh, a paper that we wrote um, in 2020 um, that was aiming at highlighting some of the key problems with traditional approaches to literature reviews uh, and to provide a few examples of ways that you can mitigate them to try to produce more reliable uh, evidence syntheses. So as you heard, I'm a senior research fellow at the Stockholm Environment Institute uh, and a senior researcher at the Makeda Research Institute on Global Commons and Climate Change. I'm also an honorary research associate at the Africa Center for Evidence, and I'm really um, honored to be able to represent my organizations here today. This is the paper I'm going to introduce, and I wanted to just spend uh, a moment um, acknowledging my co-authors who helped to produce this paper. Um, I also want to acknowledge the, the funders who are currently uh, supporting my work, Vinova, Swedish, uh, the Swedish Innovation Agency, Formas, also in Sweden, and the Humboldt Foundation. Um, and also I'm using quite a lot of icons from Flat Icon, um, if you're interested where they came from. So we are in an exciting time at the moment. Um, I will just switch my video off as well. Um, there's some important stuff going on in the top right hand corner later on. Um, so we're in an exciting time at the moment. More and more research is being published every year. Um, and I demonstrate this here uh, with a, a search in lens.org, which is a free uh, bibliographic database to show that in 1950, there were 577 articles published on the topic of mountains, broadly speaking. Um, and today there are over 22,000. That gives an indication of the, the increase in the volume of research over time. So that's 40 times more research today than there was in 1950. Um, and interestingly, uh, for me at least, social science seems to lag behind. Um, so when I restricted this just to social science topics within the same search, we have just 500 papers published a year um, in mountain regions um, compared to 22,000, more than 22,000 across all disciplines in 2020. Um, so I, I just found that interesting, that's this discrepancy. At the same time, just as primary research is increasing in volume, so too does the number of systematic reviews. And these reviews should be based on rigorous methods to reliably summarize evidence for use in decision making. That's essentially what I mean by a systematic review. And you can see this um, really exponential growth in systematic reviews over the last 20 years. And systematic reviews are robust methods for summarizing large evidence bases in response to evidence needs but they should also facilitate evidence-informed decision-making. Systematic reviews, what are they exactly? Well, they're stepwise, meticulous, uh, meticulously planned and enacted methods for summarizing bodies of evidence. And they should use state-of-the-art procedures to ensure that transparency, repeatability, and procedural objectivity are maximized throughout. Those are really the central cornerstones of systematic reviews. And systematic reviews help to summarize primary studies for use in summaries and decision support systems. That's where they sit on this process from knowledge creation to knowledge use. But the issue that I really wanted to um, focus on is that we see that there's too much evidence for decision makers to read themselves. And we see an increase in evidence synthesis that aims to support decision making by summarizing these evidence bases. But the real problem is that rigorous and trustworthy systematic reviews require time. They require resources. Um, so this is looking at the amount of time that's needed for systematic reviews. Uh, it's from, you can see the link to the project down at the bottom that looked at predicting time needed for systematic reviews. And it shows that for the average systematic review, we need 167 person days of time. As I said, we need resources. We need careful planning for systematic reviews. They need to be based on really strong methodology 
And that also requires consensus among a group of experts. So there's a need there for a lot of people involved in a project. And they also require considerable research skills, some of which are not um, particularly well developed within the broader research community. So what I'm gonna spend the next 20 minutes or so explaining is to uh, touch on eight problems that we identified, key problems that um, are frequently seen in traditional approaches to literature review. Uh, and there's one bonus problem um, because uh, Nunez and Amano responded to our paper in Nature, Ecology and Evolution with a really important point that we had largely missed, focusing uh, on languages, and I'll come to that later. But um, that's why uh, I also want to acknowledge them, but to say that this is really eight plus one problems. Um, and then also our suggestions of how they can be fixed. So the first problem relates to a lack of relevance in the final review that could be caused by limited stakeholder engagement. As with any research project, a systematic review should be a response to a need for knowledge, whether that's needed by researchers, policymakers, or practitioners. The evidence need then highlights an area where the evidence should be produced. It should then be translated and then used in evidence form decision making. That's the cycle of evidence use. But limited engagement with stakeholders could mean that there's a mismatch between what was needed and what was produced. There are numerous examples of that. We go into a couple of examples in our paper. But that mismatch then leaves the decision maker without a clear answer and a wasted research project. So it's really important that the knowledge need is matched to what's produced from an evidence synthesis. And there are lots of different definitions of who stakeholders are in a review. Each review is defined by the intended end user and all other individuals or groups affected by the review project. So it's important to note that the stakeholders for a review might not entirely match on uh, directly to the stakeholders for a topic or for um, an issue of concern. Stakeholders for a review are um, potentially a, a slightly smaller group. There are also lots of ways that stakeholders could be involved in a review, both for the benefit of the review and for the benefit of stakeholders. So stakeholders exist in complex landscapes. They don't um, just appear for a review project. So we need to bear that in mind when we're doing a review that we are dealing with uh, a complex landscape of stakeholders. But our suggestion is that there are lots of resources already available to support carefully planned and meaningful stakeholder engagement, like this hub for stakeholder engagement that's based on a special series of papers, all focusing on different aspects of engaging stakeholders in systematic reviews, a series of accompanying webinars and free training materials. So it's not impossible to design a thoughtful and meaningful stakeholder engagement, but missing that stakeholder engagement step could mean that the review project doesn't match onto the evidence need. Another issue relates to mission creep and lack of a protocol. I'm going to explain what I mean. A protocol is an a priori, meaning it's set out in advance, time-stamped plan for a review that outlines in detail every method that's going to be used in a review or a map project. It allows feedback to be received before starting, and it allows the review to be improved before the methods are actually enacted. It also acts as a checklist to demonstrate that everything has been done in the final review according to the original plan and that there hasn't been what's called mission creep where what you end up focusing on is not what you initially planned. That also then overlaps with our previous point about stakeholder engagement. And it acts as a practical roadmap within the team to ensure that everybody agrees on methods, that the methods are clear enough to actually put into practice and that the review project stays on target and on time. The problem comes when reviews don't have a protocol. This example was a review on insect population declines that some of you might have seen that was published, I think, in January 2019. The review used a seriously deficient search string that misses tons of literature. And the lack of a protocol meant that there was no opportunity for public feedback from researchers, from experts, and from methodologists. 
They also suffered from mission creep. So initially they searched for evidence on declines, but then made conclusions about all insect populations globally, whether they declined or increased. And ways of getting around this are to use some of the many resources that are available to help people craft protocols. This one is a, an example of the website of the Collaboration for Environmental Evidence that has free guidelines. Their journal, Environmental Evidence, which has lots of really useful examples of really high quality systematic reviews and maps, both protocols and final reports. And then things like reporting standards, like Rose's reporting standards, which act as a checklist and a useful template to make sure that you're including all of the relevant information, both at the protocol planning stage and the final review stage. Another problem relates to a lack of transparency. So the ability to replicate research is a cornerstone of the scientific method. And the same is true for reviews as it is for primary research. We simply can't trust research unless we know how it was conducted. That transparency then allows the methods to be verified and scrutinized. With reviews in particular, it allows people to understand what evidence was included or excluded, when and why. And it also allows the work to be built on, to be replicated and reused. And that helps to mitigate and reduce research waste. Systematic review authors need to provide complete detail for all of their methods in a way that would allow someone to reenact their review precisely. And that includes things like where they searched, what terms they searched with, how they assessed agreement between reviewers, how they screened articles, what the inclusion criteria or exclusion criteria were, how they assessed study validity or quality or reliability, how they extracted data from each study, and then what methods they used to synthesize the studies in the end. And as I mentioned before, the uh, resources like uh, Rose's reporting standards help to make sure that people are reporting uh, the methods that they used and what they found in enough detail to allow for replicability that, through that full transparency. So the resources are available to support this. In the field of healthcare, they have something called PRISMA. Selection bias is a common problem in traditional literature reviews when studies are cherry picked selected because of their findings, perhaps supporting a particular view. This can lead to confirmation bias, even when there's not a particular intention to mislead. Uh, and the results can be unrepresentative of the evidence base if the evidence base hasn't been assessed systematically and comprehensively. And a review can be precise and accurate, or it can be precise but entirely wrong. And this then relates to transparency. If a review isn't transparent, we can't tell whether the findings are precise um, or accurate or both. We just don't know what was done. Ways to avoid this are to piece together the evidence by searching across multiple different resources, lots of diverse resources, lots of different ways. Casting the net wide to ensure all available potentially relevant evidence is assessed. And the overlap across sources is easily dealt with, but missing evidence isn't. Systematic reviews should also follow a stepwise systematic process for identifying and assessing evidence. And we need to avoid selecting studies based on what we already know about their findings. Publication bias occurs when positive, confirmatory or significant research is more likely to be submitted and published in the academic literature. What we see then is not representative of the true evidence base because a particular set of studies might have been missed. Similarly, if we only search for evidence in the so-called academic literature, we miss a body of research called grey literature. This might have fundamentally different findings, but it may also just substantially reduce our comprehensiveness. And there are two main types of grey literature. You can read more about this in the paper at the bottom of the screen file draw literature, so-called file draw re, uh, research, that never made it into a journal is the first type. This is often because of difficulties in getting it past peer review, perhaps because it isn't considered con uh, sufficiently novel or significant. And we search for this by asking our networks and stakeholders to submit studies, by searching preprint servers and repositories 
to get an idea of which studies were intended to be published but then weren't. And registries like uh, lists of project funding or trial registers where people register their intent to conduct a study. This is particularly common in the field of healthcare, but it's becoming increasingly common in environment as well. Practitioner generated research is the second type. This is a type of research that was never really intended for an academic audience. And it includes things like organization reports, white papers and government reports. And we search for this on organizational websites, in libraries, with calls for evidence and using practitioner networks. Finally, we can try to deal with publication bias, at least by identifying a potential risk that publication bias crept into our review by searching for evidence of that bias in the final review analysis. So another issue uh, relates to critical appraisal of research quality. We all know that some research is better quality than others. It varies in quality across the evidence base. And we also know that some research, despite the idea that peer review is a gatekeeper, is fatally flawed and not reliable. For that reason, all relevant studies in a systematic review must be critically appraised to ensure that we know which studies in our evidence base are more reliable and which we shouldn't be trusting in a final synthesis. Critical appraisal needs to be based on an a priori, that means designed in advance, detailed plan, perhaps as a checklist, aiming to understand the major potential sources of bias in each study. It requires careful thought about how studies were conducted and how their validity affects how much we can trust their findings. This then allows us to understand how their reliability affects the reliability and conclusions of our own synthesis as a whole. Another problem is that some literature reviews don't use robust and appropriate methods for synthesizing, for drawing together the studies that they've identified. Firstly, some systematic reviews involve meta-analysis. That's the quantitative summary of quant quantitative studies. And some meta-analyses are conducted without robust methods to identify and collate studies before the statistical analysis. So we should really be aiming for systematic reviews, some of which might include meta-analysis, but not meta-analyses on their own without a robust systematic approach to collating and screening evidence. Just as in searching, screening and critical appraisal, sorry, just as in searching, screening and critical appraisal need to be robust, uh, so too must meta-analysis. Sometimes authors are so desperate to combine studies statistically, but actually the methods aren't appropriate for the data that they've found. Another problem, and perhaps a more common problem, is that some review authors tally up the number of studies showing statistically significant or positive findings, and then they compare it to the negative ones, and they use that tallying of positive against negative as an evidence of an effect. So let's say we have six studies showing a positive effect and only three showing a negative effect. We might use that as evidence that a particular intervention works. But the problem is that this ignores the fact that some studies contribute more and better information than others. Not all studies are equal. We know that we talked about that in the critical appraisal um, comment as well but it also ignores the magnitude of effect. It could be that the positive studies here uh, or the significant studies might have a really small biological or um, actual effect despite being significant, but actually the negative ones might have a really huge effect despite being fewer studies. So this tallying up ignores the detail in the quality and the magnitude of effects. So how do we deal with this? Well, reviewers should make sure that their methods for synthesis are fit for purpose. It's totally acceptable not to synthesis, synthesize study findings with meta-analysis if they're not suitable for meta-analysis. Instead, a so-called narrative synthesis should be part of all reviews, using figures, tables, and text to summarize study findings across different groups and uh, different contexts. But the bottom line is vote counting should always be avoided. This real example that I've put here shows how easy it is for a review 
uh, to allow a user to tally up studies or to tally up studies and allow a user to interpret that um, when there's, the studies are summarized according to whether they're positive or negative, um, mixed or unclear or no effect, as you can see here. So here it looks as though this particular intervention works in montane or alpine ecosystems because there are 13 studies showing a positive effect, no studies showing a negative, and two studies showing mixed and unclear effect. But it's simply not possible to actually say that with such a rudimentary assessment. We miss the magnitude of each effect and an assessment of where, which studies are more reliable. So hopefully this demonstrates that vote counting should be avoided. Finally, um, it isn't possible to conduct a reliable systematic review working alone. Without being able to have input from other colleagues and experts, we can't be really sure that we've interpreted our criteria correctly, or that another out, uh, result could be that our findings might be biased by our own beliefs, our own um, sort of preconceived biases. So to fix that, reviews should always be based on a strong review team and that allows for a checking that we've interpreted our criteria, methods, and definitions in the same way, that disagreements in application of our methods are discussed um, in a transparent way, and solutions to those disagreements are achieved through consensus. And it also allows us to be more likely to spot mistakes in the way that we've conducted our review, and also building capacity for checking for errors. Finally, this bonus point here relates to language. Nunez and Amano responded to our original paper, as I said, to point out the important role that languages play in a reliable systematic review. So any review that aims to synthesize evidence from areas where English isn't the first spoken or written language should carefully consider what evidence they will miss if they restrict their searching and screening to English. English only reviews might miss the important evidence provided by important local voices. They might also miss an important part of an evidence base. They might fail to be comprehensive. And as a result, their findings might not be reliable. So how do we deal with this? Well, to combat language bias, reviewers should be performing targeted searches in all relevant languages when searching for gray literature and when identifying language specific databases that they want to search in. But beyond just searching, reviewers also need to plan to screen and to read the potentially relevant research results when they find them that aren't in English. Although this sounds like a really big challenge, we can do this by building a strong team with diverse language skills. This then also likely helps with an understanding of local context and with contacting relevant stakeholders because their networks uh, are likely to be different and diverse. We should perhaps also think about budgeting for translation. Um, but in some cases, basic information could be perhaps extracted using translation tools where the risk of misinterpretation is low. But ultimately as well, I think reviewers should be asking ourselves, should we really be doing a global review that covers dozens of different languages and different contexts if actually what we're really interested in is English language research from first language English countries. If that's the case, then we should narrow down our scope because claiming to be global but not assessing the global literature is then a mismatch between the aims and the outputs. So that's another important um, consideration there. So hopefully over the last 20 minutes or so, I've convinced you that there are a number of pitfalls for literature reviews that can drastically affect the, re the reliability and usefulness of evidence in decision-making. But it's not all doom and gloom. There are also a suite of methods that have been carefully designed and tested that you can put into place in a review to mitigate against these risks. And thankfully, there are a lot of resources available to guide you through this process. The Collaboration Gui uh, for Environmental Evidence Guidelines are one example. There's also a set of free self-paced online training resources in systematic reviews, systematic mapping, and stakeholder engagement 
uh, on the link provided here. So there's lots of information available. Hopefully some of the examples I've given um, give you an indication for how much support there might be available. Um, but really we should be moving towards more robust, rigorous evidence synthesis to support decision-making. So thanks very much for your time. If you want to know more, you can read the article uh, that I've provided here. And there is a link to the um, read-only free access um, point for this article as well. Thanks very much. Wonderful. Thanks very much, uh, Neil, for, for that great overview. Um, at this point, I would be happy to invite attendees to share any questions uh, or comments that you would like to share. Daniel, feel, please feel free to use the Q&A. Uh, we are monitoring to make sure that we can um, uh, read those out on your behalf if you wish, otherwise put your hand up. Um, the floor is yours. Any takers? While we wait for the brave first person to ask their question, I would like to uh, remind you that the slides that Niels has presented today, if some of you joined a little bit later, um, will be um, available for you. There's a link already on the chat where you can download the slides. And of course, the recording and the slides will also be shared um, after this event uh, in the next few days. So in the meantime, any, uh, any questions? I see we have a question coming in. Let me see from really Anna. Good. Shall I read it out? There's a comment on the chat and a question in the Q&A. Great. Um, so there's a comment here on the chat. Let's start with James uh, Kishna. Thank you for your comment. Uh, in small fields, reviews often decline uh, to assess the quality of papers because the reviewers don't want to make enemies. Any hints how to handle this issue? Would you like to take that question? Yeah, it's a really interesting one. Um, this is how I kind of felt when I started. Um, actually, many of the systematic reviews that I, I work on, I'm a methodologist and I'm not, I'm not actually in that field. So I'm in a lucky position not to worry about it too much, but it is a real concern. But um, one of the key things that I try to be sure of is actually to avoid using the word quality when I'm writing a systematic review. What we talk about with critical appraisal of study validity, uh, there's two concepts. One is internal validity, and that is how well each study um, conducted its research to answer the question it set out to. And um, some people refer to this as quality, but it's essentially how well replicated, how well, um, designed and how well enacted were the methods. Um, and we, we recognize that within an evidence base, some people have more resources and some studies are, are much less well resourced. So um, although even the word validity might, might sort of rub people up the wrong way, what we're recognizing is that there is always a spectrum of validity, of strength of evidence, and that's not necessarily purely down to quality. That's one issue. So some of it is to do with language that can help. Um, and the, the second thing I would mention is that the second concept of critical appraisal is external validity. And this is how well one study maps onto your research question in your review. And we recognize that it's not always black and white as to whether a study is answering the same question as you. They might be answering a slightly overlapping question. And as, a, as an example there, I was involved with a systematic review on the impacts of plowing on soil organic carbon. And some of the evidence base um, had looked at soil organic carbon at various depths, um, all the way down to sometimes several meters. And you need really to be able to look at the depth of soil because each different depth has different amounts of carbon and it moves around and uh, the soil compact. So you need to be looking at a depth and you get a nice profile of different data at different depths. Some of our evidence in that review came from studies that were looking at microbial diversity in the top five centimeters of the soil. 
Mm. So while they provided data that was useful for us, they weren't intending to look at the entire soil profile because they were only mainly interested in bacteria. That wasn't low quality research, but the external validity didn't match. So for our purposes, those st studies had a low external validity, even though their internal validity may have been very high. It's easy to get lost in jargon, but what, what you're really talking about there is sometimes some of it is being careful about the language that you use, and the other is being careful to be clear that some evidence wasn't aiming to answer the question you're answering. And while that top five centimeter research might have been useful for us looking broadly at initial concentration in the top of the soil, to look at the whole soil profile, it had a lower contribution to the evidence base than other studies that had looked deeper. So we tried to be very clear about that. And it's always a, um, a trade-off between internal and external validity. So some studies that are very externally valid might have a low internal validity. And to give an example, if you've got landscape scale research, can't really be replicated. And then you've got laboratory studies where replication is easy, but actually the external validity of a, a real um, scenario, how well that maps onto real life, is fairly low for a high internal validity study. So it's, it's about not saying that low internal validity or low external validity means low quality. It's much more nuanced and complex. Um, but I think there's always a risk that if people have yeah. conducted bad research, you might upset them. But I think at the end of the day, it's important that people know how reliable evidence is. And that's why it's also important in critical appraisal to compare studies with a realistic gold standard, not to say, you know, you haven't used blinding in treatment allocation in your study, and actually the study was on uh, plowing. So you can't blind a farmer and send him out to start plowing fields. Yeah. So it, it's about being realistic and pragmatic as well. That is a that, that's a very excellent point, and uh, as you say, I think it's the, the the how the language is presented, packaged, and the degree of objectivity that's used to be able to 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 appraise, as you say, rather than uh, create a normative comparison, which would otherwise, um, uh, as you said, um, highlight not necessarily what what you're hoping to highlight. So. One one other quick um, yeah, please. I think it relates to stakeholder engagement. Because I, I think if you have a field where the, um, the methods might be open to criticism because they're fairly low validity or what we might say low quality, I think it's important then to, to think about a role for stakeholder engagement in designing a critical appraisal tool. So if you pull together lots of experts from outside your review team to design a tool that would appraise the quality or the validity of studies, then the community has been involved and the criticism won't be directed so much at you because you've involved people in designing a universally acceptable or perhaps not universally accepted but a widely acceptable tool for looking at the quality so it's not about saying i think your research is low quality right. it's about trying to to sort of involve people in that sorry to interrupt Wonderful. you no, ex excellent, excellent point of it. And um, that is certainly something to consider. And I hope that answers uh, James's question, uh, which I think it's a, a very important element to, to bring up. Uh, we have a couple of questions in the Q&A, which I'm very pleased to see. Uh, we have a question from Anna Ochoa. Uh, and she's asking um, <laughs> a very important experience. I've also dealt with this in, in a previous project during the systematic review writing, and this is the writing of the evidence now. Uh, in many cases, since there are many authors, uh, sometimes experts in a specific section of the paper, um, dealing with specific sections of a paper, how to organize the writing in a way that the paper does not end up being a stitching of a Frankenstein, so to speak. <laughs> Yeah, Any I, tips on that? Uh, this is more like a team team management or, or team team engagement, I suppose, yeah? yeah. I think we've all experienced that sort of very bolty on type of paper. It's a really good point. I think the nice thing about systematic reviews and maps is actually that they're, they're really formulaic in how you write them. Um, when you read systematic reviews, many of them um, tend to have very short background sections and the discussion actually tends to be quite brief. And the idea is that the evidence speaks for itself. 
So although the evidence might need or will need interpretation, you need to be careful not to overreach. So often what you might see in a, a normal discussion article, uh, discussion section of an article, people might be hypothesizing about why things happen and sort of thinking beyond the scope of the paper to try to place their research in context. And actually, to some extent, you want to avoid that in a systematic review. You just present the findings. You might say implications for policy and research, but you don't really give recommendations or advice because evidence only informs decision making. It doesn't dictate it. And you are probably only looking at a small picture of the broader evidence base. So to, to some extent, you can rely on the fact that there are reporting standards and templates for how to write a review that mean that it really does structure itself around the level of detail in the methods, the sections in the results, and then the discussion section is actually quite brief. The best place to put those more nuanced, uh, hypothesis-driven um, opinion style pieces are in commentaries that then complement your paper. So to some degree that helps. I also think from a practical perspective, a systematic review um, also benefits from having one systematic review team leader who takes responsibility for starting that backbone of a, of a paper. And then contributions are more to the editing because it's written itself largely than it is to, you know, you're going to write the results section and you're going to write the method section. Um, it really helps to have someone who's experienced in systematic reviews or has had training in systematic reviews to, to start writing that because it fits into a backbone, backbone quite easily. That said, it is still a problem. So, yeah. Yeah. so especially in, in interdisciplinary teams, where the um, uh, also the, the way in which we understand certain terminology or interpret certain results come already with a with a with a certain filter, if you like, or, or lens through which we we look at those results. So the, the writing of that can be um, a bit of a challenge if there isn't that coordination prior to to engaging in the writing exercise. Um, thanks a lot for that um, uh, question, Anna. And I would also add, uh, you make an excellent point, Neil, about the difference between evidence-informed versus evidence-based. And uh, we see the two very much interchangeably being used in many papers that claim to be evidence-based when in fact, in fact, what they're doing is informing based on a very specific scope or, or um, degree of detail. Um, and when engaging with policymakers, indeed, we need to be aware of the fact that um, they may be informed, but not necessarily basing their policies on uh, a single uh, review paper. Absolutely. We have another question here from uh, Viraj, um, and he says, hi, Neil. I'm currently doing what you might characterize uh, as a systematic mapping. We're trying to see the drivers of changes in ecosystems in Nepal. Uh, they've categorized these drivers into several categories and counted uh, which drivers are more often occurring than others. Would this qualify as vote counting? I'm trying to see a significant occurrence of drivers to nature so that I could do a focused literature review later on. So uh, this is not exactly a counting negative and positive effects. So I'm not sure uh, if this would be tagged as vote counting. What are your views? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think fundamentally, a mapping, evidence mapping focuses on what's the state of the evidence. And that is asking all of the questions up to the point where you see the results. So it's a bit like if you imagine a screen up and you don't know what people have found, but you know what they studied, what systems they investigated, how they designed their um, methods, how they conducted their methods, which outcomes they measured, all of that stuff um, is if you saw their plans but didn't know what they found. So if you can answer those questions about drivers based on what they studied, so did they, did they try to measure a driver or not, then I think it's fine. If your question, and I can't, I can't quite tell from your question, but if your question relates to where you've gone into a study and looked at whether they report a driver was influential or not, that for me would be vote counting. Um, and the reason that, that there'd be potential causes for concern are that authors might not have reported drivers that were non-significant. 
So they might have chosen to write a paper up about the significant drivers and what they measured. You know, their study might actually have measured several drivers and what they're just reporting are the significant ones. Correct. So then you lose all of that evidence that, that would support a non-significant effect of many drivers and you're only finding drivers that were mentioned. And then you're, you're sort of treating what the authors say, say as the truth without critically appraising the methods that they used. So um, I think there are certain things that you could do to make yourself robust against those issues, like looking for reporting bias. So do they mention things in their methods that they might have measured that they don't report in their results? Um, you could then conduct critical appraisal to look at how, how well were the methods designed for finding that driver. Um, and you could look at how strong was the evidence for that driver. So assuming that you have a study that was highly valid, um, do, they, do they quantify the strength of the driver? Is it, is it a really strong evidence that that driver is there or is it just weak evidence? And it's those things, it's looking at the quality of studies and the magnitude of the effect that can help to make it more robust to, to tally evidence. You still shouldn't really be tallying it, but you might be able to say, even if you can't do a meta-analysis, you might be able to say, of our 10 studies, um, three of them found this driver, and two of those studies were counted as being uh, high validity. And those two studies showed uh, what we might call a moderate effect based on, on some sort of table of, of size of effect. Um, and I think, I mean, um, there's, there's tables of, uh, um, what's the word, like it for the IPCC looking strength of evidence and those kind of things. That's, That's right. kind of what it's aiming to do, but rather than just saying these drivers are important in, in these 10 studies and these drivers are not because they weren't referenced, um, you need more nuance than that because actually, the ones that weren't mentioned might have been studied, but just not reported. And the ones that are mentioned might be really small. So it's basically, it's hard to, to tell from exactly from your question, you know the subject, um, Viraj, more than, more than I do, obviously, but um, sure. that's the sort of thing. If, you, if you're basing it only on methods, great, that's systematic mapping. But if you're looking at study findings, you need to build in critical appraisal. Mm -hmm. Very good. I hope that answers your question, uh, Viraj, feel free to uh give us a sign if that's the case thank you <laughs> thanks very much um any other questions uh colleagues uh, we still have a few minutes uh yes gabrielle is uh reminding us um that uh, we do indeed have the the next call for the synthesis workshop coming up later in march we haven't yet opened the call but uh, you can get a sense of the sorts of synthesis uh, systemic um uh, workshops that have been funded in the past and some of the projects that are now uh, concluding as part of the result of uh, prior funding. And um, in fact, some of the upcoming uh, lectures that are uh, coming up in the next few months will show some of those results. Some of them have done systemic reviews, others not so much, uh, but it'll be interesting to see the extent to which uh, they are reporting and, and avoid some of the pitfalls that you've uh, very well uh, pointed out uh, that we should be very, very well aware of. At and this might, point, yeah, please. I was gonna say, yeah. It might be worth mentioning that um, sometimes it can be very daunting and seem impossible to conduct a systematic review given small resources. You might have a PhD student largely working alone, or you might um, have, for another reason, a very small policy window, for example, where you want to do synthesis. Um, and I would just say, uh, if you're aiming to do a really high quality systematic review, then you need to plan a lot of resources and be careful about how you do it. But if you're restricted in terms of what you can do, there are other methods like scoping reviews and rapid reviews where you can be a little bit more pragmatic about what, you, what you're aiming to, as long as you're very clear about it not being a full systematic review. Um, and there are resources around how to make your review as systematic as possible within your own constraints. Um, so that's something if anybody is watching this and thinking, I don't, I'm not going to be doing a full systematic review, there are still lessons you can learn from systematic reviews to make your own research as reliable as possible. Exactly the, the points that you've made earlier about 
uh, being clear about the objective and the protocols and, and the stakeholder engagement, I think this is uh, also very often overlooked. Um, and this is applicable in just about any uh, um, situation in which we are trying to be policy relevant. So I think this is absolutely important to, 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 to recognize that many of the uh, points that you've made are also transferable in other contexts as well. Yeah. Any other final questions or comments? Maybe my colleagues from the Mountain Research Initiative Coordination Office have some comments or questions themselves. Feel free to jump in whenever you like. Ah, here we go. Here's one taker. Thanks. Thanks so much, Neil. I definitely learned a lot from your talk today and really enjoyed it. I was wondering um, when you were talking, I think it was the first common problem, but about um, a mismatch between or a mismatch with potential stakeholders. Um, did you have another example or case study in mind, um, like a teaching story for us that could tell us a little more about that? I mean, I really appreciate how you didn't just give problems, but also focused on solutions, but I would just be curious to hear if you had a specific example for that one. Yeah, um, so there's one example in the in the paper that we give from actually from one of our authors. So Sini Savalaksko was the lead author on a systematic review, I think from 2014, looking at the impacts of um, oil palm on biodiversity. And um, they did perform stakeholder engagement, but they focused on biodiversity and the, the impacts of oil palm on biodiversity, and then concluded, made conclusions about, um, you know, what the impact of oil palm was, but focusing very much on the ecology. Um, and actually they were criticized afterwards for not also taking social impacts into account because the benefits in many um, contexts of oil palm from a social perspective in terms of local economies and jobs are really high and uh, there was a criticism that you know if they if they looked at at that it wouldn't just be you know oil palm is terrible for biodiversity it would have sort of shown that nuance naturally that there are trade-offs and the answer isn't very really clear and it goes back to what you were saying about informing policy not um, policy being based on evidence alone just looking at biodiversity you know you don't see that other side of the picture so that was one um, a really humble um, example from one of our co-authors another one that um, I'm aware of was a review that was commissioned from um, DEFRA the Department for Environment Farming and Rural Affairs in the UK where the policymakers wanted to know about slurry application in, um, in farms. So the impacts of slurry. And they had several meetings with the review team and the review team went away and they, they conducted a review on the impacts of different slurry storage, uh, ways to store slurry and how it sort of impacted the environment. But actually, the commissioners wanted to know more about how it was applied and how it was stored. So, yeah. and that sounds like quite a big difference, but actually it was just a tiny definition that was misunderstood that wasn't really thrashed out. So in these stakeholder engagement processes, often, and it goes back to what you were saying about um, differences in, in disciplinary understanding as well, that um, you really need to thrash out definitions that you might think you really understand, but you might not be exactly on the same page as your, your stakeholder. I was involved in one review where um, it had two different sides. One was a qualitative side that was social science and one was a natural science side. And um, the two groups had different definitions of data, the <laughs> word data. And uh, social science was really broad and really open and ours was very narrow and focused and my definition has changed because of that. But it was just really interesting to be having all these emails where we were like, I don't understand what they're talking about. And then you have this meeting and you're like, oh, you have a completely different definition to, of data. So I wouldn't underestimate how easy it is to just be talking at length at cross purposes. Perfect. Yeah, absolutely. Excellent. Thanks very much for that input and the great reminders there. And, uh, and for the questions posed, I think this uh, shows that there's quite a lot of interest also in the experience that people have in doing systematic reviews. I think there's a lot to be learned 
exactly from the sorts of uh, experiences and feedback that you've had with your co-authors in previous projects. I think these are just mm -hmm. as insightful. And it's great to see that you, um, you, you um, make them exemplars also in the papers that you write, because that really brings the experience to life. And uh, certainly for early career researchers and others who are coming into doing systemic reviews, this is really important to, to, to learn from. Great. Uh, we only have a final few minutes. If there is any desperate last minute question that um, people would like to raise, this is your chance. Otherwise, um, I take the opportunity to thank all of you for coming uh, and joining us this afternoon here in the, wherever you might be, it's afternoon here in Zurich, but it could be morning, evening, wherever you are. Um, I don't see any last minute questions. So I guess uh, we can, uh, conclude the meeting here and I would like to thank you very much once again uh, Neil Hadaway for your excellent input here today. A reminder that the slides and the recording for this input will be shared uh, through the MRI communication channels and also made available via the website. Until then, thank you very very much, have a great rest of your day and uh, evening and uh, thanks everyone for your participation online. Until thank next time. Bye -bye. Thank you.